Welcome to the Institute of World Culture. As you know, it's a nonprofit educational institute dedicated to lifelong learning in the promotion of universal brotherhood. Uh, as you know, it's located here in Concord Hall in Santa Barbara, but it's also streaming out uh, and reaching uh, last um, forum uh, 79 people. So that's an interesting fact. A special welcome to anybody who's new. Um, you can find out more about us by picking up the blue brochure, um, by picking up um, the newsletter, going to the website, worldculture.org, or just asking um, anybody um, who looks like they've been around a while. <laughs> Um, my name is Carolyn Dorrance, and I'll be serving as the chair for today's event. Um, as indicated, information can be founded on our website, worldculture.org, and in the monthly newsletter, which you can receive if you sign up on the um, orange sheet back there, or are you email jerry at worldculture.org. Um, for those of you uh, here in Concord Hall, in case you're interested, masks are optional, and there are restrooms over through that door. The 10 aims of the Institute are articulated in the Declaration of Interdependence, and they're also on the website. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on number one to explore the classical and Renaissance traditions of East and West and their continuing relevance to emerging modes and patterns of living. The program today is focused on knowledge and knowing in Neo-Confucianism. And if it seems uh, far away, distant, that's um, all the more reason why you will uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity to learn some uh, something broad and significant both in world history and we think the contemporary times. Our speaker today is uh, Professor Ya Zhu and she is um, uh, really very articulate. Um, she, there's all the outer things we can say about her. Uh, she's a professor of history at the University of California. She received her PhD in history from Princeton University. She is a cultural and intellectual historian of middle period and early modern China. Uh, her first book, Shen Guo's Empiricism at Harvard Inter University Press is a study of historical theory of knowledge. And she's also authored several articles which engage a wide and diverse spectrum of topics such as the history of emotions, sensory history, medical history, musicology, and book history. And that, um, uh, she also is um, uh, an academic specialist in Neo-Confucianism, so she is well qualified to present her knowledge and her insights to you today. But in addition to the external, we might say, uh, qualifications, she also has amazing personal or inner qualities. Um, she uh, is a conversationalist. She is exploratory um, in trying to connect um, not just East and West, but c classical, um, reform uh, ideas about uh, Chinese um, culture and philosophy. And she is very articulate and, and interested in connecting it all to contemporary times, and particularly trying to um, help young people see that they're, they're, they do have a tradition uh, that is relevant. Not, not to be forgotten or articulate. And she's very aware of the modern dimensions of our collective life together. 
So I think you'll find what she has to say uh, both creative and relevant. Um, we'll, be, we'll have an opportunity, she will talk for about an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. And then we will hear about um, um, other ways in which uh, this talk is going to be supported, and I'll mention it now. Uh, at the study circle this coming Tuesday, 7.30 in the seminar room or online Zoom, Zoom. She, um, uh, her talk today will be the subject of questions, discussion, and relating it also to what uh, we want to study about Taoism and Confucianism. So um, that's a follow-up which you might want to uh, attend and just ask further questions uh, that from, from fellow students. So I turn it over to you and um, welcome to the Institute and I'm sure we're going to be um, enlightened if that's the right word. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. This is a really... Uh... Thank you for this really generous uh, introduction. I think I probably, this is my microphone and I, I prefer to standing while I'm lecturing. So thank you for indulging me for this. And welcome everybody. It's really uh, my privilege and, and great pleasure to be able to be here. And I was, I, I'm, I'm a recent, I came to Santa Barbara about two, three years ago, so I'm a relatively new resident in town, so a lot of you probably will know this town way better than I do, so it's always my excitement to, to see you know, meet new people and make new friends here. Um, so um, today I am going to talk about uh, knowledge and knowing and Neo-Confucianism. Uh, are we going to have the slides on the screen or later? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's right here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Magic. Um, so um, it's, it is indeed my, one of the area of expertise of mine. Um, and the philosophy, is per particularly the metaphysics of Neo-Confucianism, is something I feel very passionate about uh, in my personal research. Um, that's why I decided I want to share it with you today. And also, I had the luck of meeting some of you here already. So I attended some activities here. My feeling of this audience is that I am enormously impressed by how deeply you are engaged with the study of spirituality or you know religious traditions across the world, you know, particularly the non-Western cultures, that a lot of you are so ready for a deep conversation <laughs> about metaphysics. So, and that was like, because you know there are various ways of introducing a subject. So today I'm here. I'm I'm very serious. You will see, I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you because I this is my way of. Um, I guess returning to the kind of intellectual inspiration I have already received from, from you. So that being said, um, I'm a, uh, I wear this mask because I lecture to 500 students this term at UCSB. Uh, that's one thing. But, but also I wanted to let you know that lecturing to a much smaller crowd here is much, is much more of my preference so that we can talk even while I'm, I'm talking. So, so my style of lecturing is always highly interactive. So I know that the Q&A will happen at the end, but please feel free to raise your hands if you have a question or if you want to make a comment while I'm still lecturing. And I may be inviting um, some comments from you while I'm talking, so, so please, and then please do respond because that's a very <laughs> genuine in, 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 in invitation. Okay, so Let's start with Neo-Confucianism. So um, part of the reason I choose to talk about Neo-Confucianism today is I get a sense from the, some of my old friends here that you are already quite familiar with Confucianism, which is, I'm going to show you the chronology here, which is the, the classical tradition of, of Confucianism um, that happened in ancient China. Okay, so roughly speaking, we're talking about the person, Confucius, who lived in um, 500 BCE, which was a long time ago. And then we're talking about a systematic learning tradition that have become, has become an ism 
about several hundred years later after his time. Okay, so it's Confucianism wasn't precisely concocted by Confucius himself. It became a systematic school of learning several hundred years later. Okay, but that's still more or less in the periods of antiquity and late antiquity. And Neo-Confucianism, which is the subject today, happens mostly from the medieval times through all the way through late imperial or early modern. Basically, you know, all the way through today, I, I would even say, you know, the Confucianism that people talk about in contemporary China still more or less belongs to Neo-Confucianism. Um, so, so I am basically offering you a newer version of Confucianism that you know happen, occurs later in history and also closer to the modern times. So that's the temporal, temporal meaning of my choice. And also another reason I'm picking it is because the, the reason I just mentioned, I think you're really ready for a highly metaphysical conversation here. That's the metaphysics is something that a lot of you are really interested in. And Neo-Confucianism is much more explicitly philosophical and much more prominently metaphysical comparing to classical Confucianism. Um, so if you have, have any encounter with Confucius before, which is the classical thinker, most people will see him as like a nice old guy talking about life and you know, goodness and you know, ethics or you know, way, you know, ethical knowledge in the analogs. Um, and that's, why for, that's one of the primary reasons why some philosophy departments such as ours at UCSB still does not accept you know, Chinese philosophy as philosophy. Because they're like, where is the metaphysics, right? Where is the epistemology, which is theory of knowledge, the topic of today. Um, and then it's all like, uh, you know, it's like airport reading. It's like how to be a good person, things like that. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend time on, on talking about that. But, but the, the, the version of um, new, uh, Confucianism I'm introducing today is very clearly and uh, explicitly philosophical. So that, well, that's another reason why I'm choosing the subject. Um, and then, of course, and since we're talking about this new historical time period, I'm introducing some new thinkers who you know, lived in later part of Chinese history. And there are a lot of them, but I'm introducing the, one of the, the central ones, and whose name is Zhu Xi, Mr. Zhu. How many of you have heard about Zhu Xi before? OK, that's fine. We don't, you know, that's, you know, the, then he's the excitement in the room then because he's, <laughs> the new person is always interesting. All right. So that's my very brief uh, rationale in terms of why we're talking about uh, neo-confusionism and what it is. Any questions so far? Okay. Anyone curious why Buddhism is here? <laughs> So it's, I hope it's a well-known fact that Buddhism arrived in China very, very early and became very influential. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, good. Yeah. 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 Part very of the important. yeah, very important indeed. Part of that importance is its influence on Confucianism, and that's why Neo Confucianism had the specific outlook I'm going to talk about today, because it actually looks very Buddhist. Uh, this, this is the fourth reason why I choose this, because I know some of you here really knows a lot about Buddhism and is interested in Buddhism, and me too. Okay, now let me switch to why I talk about knowing specifically and knowledge in Neo-Confucianism, because Neo-Confucianism is a broad concept. It's a system. Um, to which a lot of components are worth consideration. Uh, but I'm interested in, in knowing, um, partly because I am an expert on the theory of knowledge. I'm also a history historian of science. Um, but also, the more important reason is not about me, because knowing, or zhi in Chinese, in the original language, is the fundamental component of Neo-Confucian philosophy. Okay, and the fundamental significance, as I can as I can articulate, is that because it is a mandatory, so knowing to know to have knowledge, is a mandatory procedure by which one reaches the ultimate goal of Neo-Confucianism, and that ultimate goal would be the perfection of moral cultivation. Okay, 
Uh, so, and then uh, to put in other words, a neo confusion exercises her agency via knowing, okay, the act of knowing with the aspiration of attaining the way. Okay, so the way or the Tao is just another way of saying the perfection of moral cultivation. Okay, so this, basically these two statements I put out here are synonymous with one another. So I'm just introducing the original vocabulary here, which is the way, but I also want you to know that that means the perfection of moral cultivation. All right, and then of course we want to define what's Per, per, what's perfection of moral cultivation to? Because we all have different ways of understanding how to be a good person, right? So what is what it means to be moral? But for neo-Confucians, the specific meaning is the state of constant and spontaneous sagacity. Okay, I guess sagacity is easy. You know, it's it's it's, it's you know ultimate goodness. Constant, probably also straightforward, because you know we, we strive to be good in a persistent a consistent matter, right? The spontaneous part, I think it's the interesting part. And then I'll unpack that later as we, we, as we um, explore the meaning and the connotations of knowing, okay? So this is my, um, then again, the reason why I'm choosing knowing because really, indeed, for neo-Confucianism and a ostensibly moral, philosoph moral, moral philosophy or ethical knowledge, the most fundamental procedure by which moral perfection was achieved indeed was through knowing. Okay? So that's about the significance of knowing. And then I'm showing you what are the common types of knowing, you know, knowledge that um, neo Confucians like to talk about. Uh, knowledge comes in a variety of different kinds. I think that's something that we are, it's a concept we are familiar as well. Um, so I'm, uh, there are so many, the myriads of them, the car categorizations, um, they happened in, you know, through different contexts and then some binaries are related to others. So it's not always a neat hierarchy or a system here, but I'm in introducing, introducing some of the interesting and also relevant ones today. Uh, just to start with, what is knowing, okay, or zhi in Chinese? Um, it's broader than what we mean by to know in modern languages. It's a kind of cognitive and cognitive awareness. So for one, it's an awareness. For another, it's a cogn cognition and emotion. So cognitive and cognitive. So it's an aware, it could, could be a combination of Propositional cognition combined with your feeling. Okay, so what you know combined with how you feel. So these are all really inclusively um, incorporated into the understanding of knowing. Okay, so that's why I mentioned this is actually broader than we talk about, because then we, because in our, you know, in, in our language today, we tend to differentiate between what we know and how we feel. Right, so I know for a fact this, you know, the, 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 that color is brown uh, versus I have a feeling that that color is brownish. These are two very different statements in our language. But there are, both dimensions actually are seamlessly integrated um, into what, we, what is known in Neo-Confucianism, okay? I'll talk more about this, but I just want to get you prepared that emotion is very important here, okay? Um, and then I'm introducing two, bi uh, two binaries. Basically, these two pairs of things come together, you know, as, as ways of categorizing different type of knowledge. Uh, one is uh, the so-called knowing from hearing, seeing. Uh, I think it's self-evident. That means uh, sensory perception, you know, what I see and what I hear, you know, the, the things I acquire through my senses. Um, and then the, in this pair, Another, th uh, what, what compares to or contrasts with knowing from here and seeing is knowing from virtuous nature. I'm gonna explain in a minute why, what it means. But for now, what you need to know is that they're a pair because knowing from virtuous nature is considered as a higher form of knowing than sensory perception. Because Neo-Confucians have a lot of criti criticisms of sensory perception. Um, thinking, uh, considering them as being limited, 
Um, they are convenient, expedient, but this kind of sensory knowing really affords no access to the deeper fa facts of the world. It's, it's superficial and it's limited. Okay. In comparison to that, knowing from virtuous nature is a higher form of learning precisely because it, it affords a kind of deep understanding of patterns of things. Um, the, here are the things including humans. So we are things as well, um, according to Neo-Confucianism. Um, and, uh, and also another different point here is that we use our heart and mind to discern rather than using our eyes or hearing as in sensory perception. Okay? Another, then again, you see this kind of awkward word, heart and mind always comes together. This is my point. Emotion and cognition are always integral to one another. Okay? They're really talking about here. So the Chinese word here is indeed referring to you know, the heart we have. But it's not just heart in the sense that it's our feelings. It's also here. So here and here always come together. Okay? So that's, that's one. This is going to be a really important binary that we are going to explore later today. Okay? So just, you know, for, for this moment, you just need to uh, have a first you know, introduction of, these, uh, of this dichotomy. Um, and another pair is, is between genuine and ordinary knowledge. Um, so this, this is interesting, I think, because it really sh demonstrates the, the emphasis on practice in Neo-Confucian theory of knowledge. Because what's being, what's being considered as genuine knowledge is that knowledge which sparks spontaneous moral actions. And that is to say, um, the criteria by which we discern a genuine type of knowledge really is it's just to, to, to look at the car, you know, what, if, whether it generates an action and also the nature of that action. Okay? Yeah, you have a question? Um, would that include conscience? Mm, you, you mean genuine knowledge, does it yeah. include conscience? Yes. Yes. I think, you know, con you know it, we have to be conscious. You know, it, it, it is, the, I think the assumption is that a person would be consciously knowing and then carried out a, a moral action with a full understanding of what she's doing. So I think consciousness has always been a constant factor in the, in the procedure. If I uh, imagine if I, you, if I, I you know, did say, said or did something in my dream, even if it's, even if it's virtuous, I mean, it's moral that, you know, if it's good for other people, that would be a different issue, right? Is that what we were thinking about? Uh, that's part of it, but then mm -hmm. we also talk about the end result, which is mm. acting on your conscience because you see. Oh, your... conscience, not consciousness. Okay, conscience. Okay. Yeah, that. You know what? We can return to this <laughs> because you know, because I do have a lot to say about that. Because conscience, then, with conscience meaning that this moral action would have the backing of a very well articulated moral plan behind it. So a rationale. Say if I uh, see a wallet on the floor, I pick it up and I know it's Yvonne's, I return it to her, to her. Uh, it could be. It could be that I have thought about it. So I first identify whose wallet is that, and I figure that's not mine. That's property belonging to someone else, and that someone else might be hurting if she has lost her wallet. Um, and then just that, that's the working of my conscience, right? And then I, I'm returning that to Yvonne in a way with the full knowledge of the, the goodness of, of what I have done. And, 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 and if invited, I can just well, well, elaborate on the reasons why I'm doing this. That's, that's, that would be the assumption of the scenario. But Neo-Confucianism, as I will, I will state later, is the, that's not the best scenario. The best scenario is I pick up the wall, I return it to Yvonne, without even thinking about it, without ever putting myself in, into, or the goodness or badness of my action into the consideration. That's what spontaneous is about. And that they value the spontane spontaneity in morality as the, as the highest um, criteria. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you asked it because it's going to come out later. But, but I think it's, 
this is the fun part and also, also maybe the more challenging part. So, uh, so we, it, it definitely, you know, it's going to be beneficial that we engage this multiple times. All right, and then ordinary knowledge is the knowledge that, you know, about something and within everyone's reach, which is exactly what it means by ordinary knowledge. But then we don't necessarily act on ordinary knowledge, uh, not to mention that our acts um, might be, should be moral. Um, so, so that gives us the contrast here that, you know, obviously genuine knowledge would be the more desirable goal to, to achieve. All right. So then again, there are so many different ways of categorizing knowing, but I'm here just giving you two examples so you get a sense, okay? You get a sense for what? <laughs> this is the more general characteristics, but I hope for at this moment you have enough specifics to engage them. The topology I was just mentioning, even just the two pairs of them, shows that many of the more conventional Western epistemological categories actually don't really work in neo-Confucianism. Um, for instance, knowing how and knowing that. I don't know if that's something that somebody has, people have thought about. What it, what is, what, knowing what is like knowing, I know, I, I know how to ride a bicycle, okay? Is that the same with I understand a, 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 a problem set in my physics test? Have you ever thought about it? Well, you could know how the, what procedure you should use uh -huh. to solve the problem. Uh huh. Okay. So for another, for in another way, how to have uh, we? I assume we all ride bikes at some point in our lives. Um, how did you learn how to ride a bike? Trial and error. Trial and error? Good, good, yes. Uh, you must have some theory, some understanding. Some understanding, yeah. You know, and, then, and then practicing. Then practicing, okay. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So, know, otherwise, how am I going to, you know, if I don't even have an idea, right. how, will, how will I even do anything? Yeah, so uh, I have a basic understanding of the structure of the bicycle, like two wheels and some, some general understanding of how to keep balance. Right? Okay. And then just practice, right? It's a, much more of a bodily embodied thing. Uh -huh. that no matter how elaborate I've understood the structure of the bicycle, to the extent I can make one, I could still not be, uh, be unable to ride a bicycle if I don't have know-how, which is bodily knowledge, right? Donna, you have a question? It's just an example of mm. a few of us trying to teach a young woman from a village mm -hmm. in um, Kenya how to ride a bicycle. And she was not able to do it. She'd not ever seen a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Did anyone ride a bicycle? She mm -hmm. didn't know the concept of a bicycle. Right. It, it was really interesting. Interesting. Very eye opening. Okay. To okay. To reflect on your own. Right. The own, your own um, lack of awareness in certain areas. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. You know what? Uh, this just reminds me when I was a kid, I didn't know how to blow a bubble using a bubble gum. And, and, and that was like shocking to my peers and my teachers. They were like, how could someone don't understand a thing of, you know, you know, bubbling gum? I just wasn't, and it took me like two years to practice. Seriously, I, that's why, you know, that, that, you know, it's extremely humbling experience that, you know, there are always things you don't understand. Even after you become a professor, that still, you know, that stays with me. Um, yeah, but that, the whole point here is knowing that and knowing how are two different kinds of knowledge. And we, in a, in a, in a classroom setting as, where I usually work, we privilege knowing that because it's all propositional. You know, it's a jargon, but it means, basically means I am laying out knowledge, introducing knowledge in the forms of arguments and points, as I'm doing right now. But I can't really do this with, teach, with a kid uh, who wants to learn to ride a bicycle. There's, so, there, there's just so much thing I can say. Like five minutes, I can finish my speech on what a bicycle is. <laughs> and then the rest is practice, right? And then I would have a hard time. That's why I, have, I was so challenged with the bubbling gum, because nobody can actually tell me how to do it, <laughs> right? My mom wanted to help. She was like, it's the easiest thing in the world. You just, you got to try it. <laughs> right, so, but then these two, Again, that it's it, the different differentiation helps us in Western epistemology in, to help us appreciate, you know, 
there are different knowledges that can be acquired through different means, right? They're not differentiated in Neo-Confucianism. And Neo-Confucianism actually have a greater focus on knowing how, in the sense that it's a skill or skilled competence. Okay, so that in a way I think it benefits modern people because you know you modern philosophy is really no matter where really privileges the theoretical and the propositional rather than the embodied and practiced. So, but then that's that's something they don't differentiate. So in a way that you know you got them all inclusively um, uh, integrated. Okay, and then the cognition and emotion. That part I've already mentioned. So, um, so how you what you know and what you th how you feel are actually also embedded, and I'll show you why that's important later. Okay, and then scientific and moral knowledge. This is another thing I want to just foreground so you get a sense why. For one, this person is a historian of science on the one hand and a moral philosopher on the other hand. And it's not because I'm so you know, multi-talented, it's because you know, they're the same thing in Neo-Confucianism. And then when I have to clarify what I do in modern languages, I have to show you both. Because they're both integrated, in, really mutually embedded into one another. Okay. All right, so I hope this is not abs too abstract. Is this is accessible? All right, okay. Because I'm really talking about the general directions. So then when we get to the more specific you know, discussions, you will, the, the, the misleading things will be out of the way. Okay? Um, and then another, uh, another um, uh, 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 characteristic is kind of cognate in the sense that we're not really talking about knowing of different kinds as insulated episodes as if they are you know, one practice not related to another. Like learning how to ride a bicycle versus learning how to do a math problem are separate. They are separate, but, but in the Neo-Confucian enterprise, they see knowing as a holistic stream of experience that combines intending, you know, in intention, perceiving, you know, sensory knowing, feeling, you know, emotion, accessing, and then acting. So they go all the way from intentionality to action. And then includes all these different components I was just talking about, you know, accessing, you know, feeling and all that. And it's a, and not that for everything or every procedure of knowing we have to do all the steps. But they they want to encourage us to see that, you know, knowing is about always about having all these different experiences seamlessly connected with one another and making them available in yourself. Okay? All right, so that's the second uh, characteristic. Um, and the third one, I really want to highlight this because I know the three keywords of uh, this year's theme for the, the institute, one of them is interdependence. One of my favorite words because, you know, this is what I do. Um, so you may, you may be wondering, you know, all these, you know, interesting, you know, characteristics, knowing all that, how is it practical, right? How do we, how do we actually exercise them? Um, and this has a lot, this question of practicality, practicality really has to do with your perception of the world. Okay, in what kind of world are we doing this kind of knowing? And this is the kind of world. The cosmos that is, for one, holistic, that is not partitioned into different parts, and then it's interdependent in the sense that, you know, everything is dependent, is dependent, depended, and depending on the other thing at the same time. Okay? And then within this world, for, as humans, we can see a lot of different things. But one thing I want to emphasize is that there is no subject-object demarcation. OK? What does that mean? What is a subject and object demarcation? Am I a subject or object? You can be both. I can be both. That's correct. So it's like seeing you. You are an object. Right, right. So you are, you are, I am currently the object of your sensory knowing, right? Your vision. That's correct. So, and then, but I'm also accepting the sense currently I have some thought, thoughts in my head. And then by processing those thoughts, I'm a subject, right? Mm -hmm. But how can we not have this in the process of knowing? In the two examples I just gave, mm -hmm. right? Either I know something or you know me. 
What does it mean? Like I'm a thing, right? I'm an entity here. Do do you do you want to? What's the? Do I not exist, or what? What does this mean? Is it possible? Anyone here? I mean, it's very difficult to imagine Western philosophies, but if you're familiar with other traditions, it's possible. Yes. When I'm mm. thinking, mm. there must be a sense in which mm. you know each one of the subject and object, mm -hmm. all of us, there's there's a unity. But you mentioned that. Right. there must be right. a unity in terms right. of which you can understand right. the subject and object. Right. Okay. Otherwise, how? Right. So in a way, when you are visually perceiving my existence, you're, you, there could be two interpretations. One is that you're the subject, which is categorically and ontologically separated from me, which is an object. And then me as an object has been completely subject to your scrutiny as, as part of your brain activities. But another way of interpreting would be that we live in this world. We're both embedded into this universe. And then you are perceiving me um, as, as uh, ac recognizing my separate identity as a different person, but in the meantime, with the, with the understanding that we share the same embeddedness in the world, with an acknowledgement with the, how we related to one another as humans. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Commonality. Right, exactly. Yes. But a good example of this subject mm. object in a sense, unity mm. would be a dancer. Because the dancer, you know, mm. is all, is having to uh, remember her right. her patterns and all that, and how she really wants to try to mm -hmm. indicate something. But she's giving instruction to her body without using her mm -hmm. body, which we see, and we see the result of her contemplation. Mm -hmm. um, there would be nothing to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the the example of dancer. I was, was it just came to my mind. I don't do this, so if I say anything wrong, please forgive me. Uh, I have a friend who's a huge fan of salsa, and then especially when you dance in pair, you don't actually talk to your dancing partner and say, hey, "This is how we're gonna do it." <laughs> you just improvise while you're dancing, um, and then in a way. So I I don't think a two people who consider each other as separate entities in that experience would do the job well because there wouldn't be any chance for you to verbally communicate. And then you're constantly thinking of yourself as something that's been separated. And it has to be forced back into coordination with your dancing partner. And that takes time to process. But the, the, the people who do it really well is just they, they just both, they both dive into this shared stream experience and having fun, enjoying themselves and you know, feeling the vibes and getting, you know, trying to explore the common reason by which they could move their bodies together. That's what I'm talking about. OK? Yes, please. Well, you know, it also connects with external internal, like subject and object. Right. So you can have a whole shared mm -hmm. objective. You also could have a whole shared subjective experience. But there's also uh -huh. you know, an identity that one can posit beyond that mm -hmm. as everyone as a perceiver or witness or Right. Right, exactly. I love that. The shared subjectivity. Yeah, that's a, actually we that's that's something I'm interested in too. That's actually a, it's it's a very advanced epistemological issue. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let, let's let's you know let, let, let let's um, try to think of the why we want to. I remember when I talked to some of my colleagues in analytical philosophy, they're really they're they're visibly mad at the suggestion and say, how can there not be a subject object division there? <laughs> but but then I want to invite us to think positively. What's the good about that? Say, say, say it's ridiculous. But if we embrace this ridiculous idea, what benefits can we acquire from this? Anything you can think of? Ivan, that's a hand? Or that's you thinking? Okay. <laughs> well, I guess self-centeredness. This is the point I put here. So while, while we are engaging in a subject object structured knowing process, we are highly aware of the center. We are centering ourselves. Because the subject is at the center. And then any object, be it be that chair or another human being, would be brought to the scrutiny of my subjectivity, be brought upon in front of my cerebral activities. It's not an equal relationship. 
Okay? So in that sense, it's, I'm not criticizing self-centeredness as a moral issue here. I'm just basically describing that's the, that's the structure of the epistemology here, that there has to be a center, and the center is the subject. Okay? Then we have to be the center of the world to know anything. But then, you know, there are a lot of things we can say about that, right? But then the one thing, the neutral point I want to point out is that we can actually do better and to have a more inclusive, if not globalist, point of view. And it may sound impossible at this moment. It's impossible because we grip onto the subject subjectivity. If you let it go, it's possible. OK? I think that's the beauty of it. All right, I'm so glad we're already having a deep conversation here because this is a general characteristic. But it will make it easier once I, you know, I, I get to the specific point. <coughs> All right, and then another thing I want to do is to talk about metaphysics a little bit in the original vocabulary. Because I, I, what I just did is to, to present the, the, the important characteristics in, in the language that is accessible to Western philosophies. But now I'm introducing more of the original vocabulary, how the neo Confucians uh, envision their worlds. And I hope with the preparation I just gave you, this will be a little bit less, a little bit more relevant and interesting. OK? So extremely broad, uh, 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 brief, by the way, because this could be, I don't know, 200 books. But here, you are going to hear this for five minutes. Uh, so basically, we're looking at a world where we are looking at a heaven or cosmos. Same thing, OK? It's the same Chinese word, tian. And then what it, the meaning of that is it, it's the source of the order of everything, OK? Uh, and then it may sound far away because the sky and heaven and cosmos, it's not. It is relevant to all of us, okay? Extremely relevant and accessible to all of us because all of us have nature. And nature comes from heaven, okay? We all have it within us because heaven give us, gives this to everybody, okay? Uh, and what is nature then? In its original state, nature is the perfect order and goodness. So basically, it's the um, continuation of the perfect cosmic, cosmic order that is up there in heaven. Okay? And then we all get our little extension of that in ourselves. But unfortunately, you know, that's the ideal situation. Nobody, no one is an ideal situation. <laughs> we are all circumstances. Uh, so in that sense, um, we, our nature often appears in an adulterated state due to, you know, the contingencies of materializations in ourselves. We're all different individuals. We're all imperfect. Okay? So then what do we do with this? And then, of course, we want to return to the outward aspire to, to return to the original state of goodness that heaven gives us, right? And that is what moral cultivation means in neo-confucianism, okay? Returning to the original state. And then we do that, use this, the heart and mind, okay? Which is the, uh, the thing that's pumping your chest as well as the thing that's your noodle, okay? Uh, and then the main means by which you do that, the activity is known. Okay, so it goes back to my original point. That's why knowing is so important, because all this moral cultivation, going back to goodness, how do you get there? It's by knowing. Okay? So that is an extremely brief sketch of this metaphysics. Okay? I just want to show you, you know, it's, it's not just in you. This is totally actually connected to the, the universe. All right? Um, so just to sum, um, so one's knowing is constantly oriented towards goodness in human nature, OK? And because of the connection between nature and heaven, it's also you know, connect, uh, oriented towards the deep structures of the cosmos. So your moral goodness is never your own thing. It's always deeply connected to how the world functions, OK? This is how and why one should remain in unity with the universe while conducting knowing. Okay? You want to know good. You want to know better. You want to know the best. That is to say, the, 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 the more you are connect, you realize or you know, restore your connection with heaven and the cosmos, the better you know. The smaller yourself has become, or the, your, your consciousness of yourself becomes reduced, the better you know. 
<laughs> okay? Once you got yourself out of the picture, then you're the best in the world. <laughs> it's, it, I think this is also, you know, a very Buddhist. It's, for those of you who are familiar with the Indian uh, philosophy, I think this actually, I think this comes from Buddhism. Mm. That's the, going to my point here. You know, Confucians, they're really inspired by, by Buddhism. <laughs> okay? All right. Now I'm giving you a very specific precept regarding knowing. And which is articulated by the famous um, thinker Zhu Xi, uh, the person I've shown the portrait to you at the beginning. And this is, I said, arguably the best known Neo Confucian precept regarding knowing, knowing knowledge. I could get rid of an arguably, it is the best known <laughs> uh, thesis regarding knowledge. Uh, it's, it's called Investigating Things and Extending Knowledge, or Gu Wu Zhi Zhi in original Chinese. Okay? Uh, so basically, what Zhu, Zhu Xi is not the first person who invoked the term, but he is indeed Wu, the one who systematically exposed it. Uh, um, and he mentions that basically means that a person should develop deep understandings of the various things that made up the world and thereby extending the knowledge for the purpose of consummating self-cultivation. Okay? Basically, you have to know a lot of things, investigate them, then you become a morally good person. Okay? It may sound gener generic in a way, but it is a very clear reaction to Buddhism. By the way, Juicy is a, I think, I, I would say he's a huge fan of Buddhism. So it's, it's not a, it's not a posing, intellectual position as if they want to eliminate one another from the intellectual landscape. Mm -hmm. It's more like a rivalry, intellectual rivalries that they appreciate each other's stances to a great extent and they try to innovate on the foundation of the difference they could actually identify within their common intellectual ground. So it's kind of a, I would say it's a healthy com competitive environment which then generates a lot of good theories. So, so in, in short, uh, why is this a reaction to Buddhism? Because Buddhism this, um, 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 the, um, posits that things in the world are devoid of inter intrinsic reality and thus empty. This is a very, very brief summary. So I would, I would be happy to talk more on this in the Q&A if you're interested in Buddhism. But then Jushi, that's why Jushi says, no, that's not true, because things are real, OK? And they're not only real, they're worse in our investigation, okay? worse our inquiries. And that's why if you're seeking the way, and then you want to learn, okay? and then you also want to learn in the piecemeal, gradual process in which you constantly you know, extend your inquiries into different things. And that was, should be contrast with the, the Buddhism example of enlightenment, because enlightenment is oftentimes is framed as a sudden moment, right? It's a sudden occurrence. All of a sudden, I have this epiphany that you know, this profound knowledge came to me in a mysterious way, as if I don't have to work for it. Now, th th then again, this is a simplified way of talking about, but Zhu Xi basically saying, no, that's not true. It has to be gradual. You have to work on it. And then it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but then you really have to go through the procedure. OK? Yes? What is um, Juzi's mm. definition of real? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm talking about. That we really have to talk about Buddhism um, in order to talk about reality. Do you mind we postpone this to the Q&A? Because that's, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm extremely interested in that, but this, you're, let's finish with Juicy first. Would that, would that be okay? Yeah, okay. I actually, I don't want to, yeah, I kind of agree with Buddhism more, but I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, let me just finish this first. All right. Okay. So then, you know, let, let me just further explain this concept by really focusing on the key concept, which is things, which is the most generic word in this phrase. And yet, it's actually the most challenging. So hopefully, we'll, we'll, you, know, you will get, you know, I'll, I'll provide a satisfy, satisfying explanation to this. So things, for one, um, they are, for one, it's very inclusive. So it refers to all objects, not just objects, though, but also processes in the world. Okay, so this microphone is a thing, this desk is a thing, 
But the fact that I'm walking from, from this table to the podium, this process is also a thing. Okay? And the person who is doing this procedure, performing the procedure myself, is also a thing. <laughs> so it's a very inclusive in the sense that it does not just refer to physical en entities, but also the various you know, you know, physical occurrences in the universal universe also count as things. Okay? All right, and so that's why, due to its inclusiveness, that when we see the conventional term myriad things or 10,000 things, you probably see that often in Chinese writing, that means the whole world. Okay, it's a shorthand for the whole world. Um, here comes the part, uh, going back to a question about reality. So why is, why is juicy, what does juicy mean by that things are real? Because he figures that everything has a coherence. Okay, I'm gonna explain coherence in a minute, but I, here I just want you to have a clear understanding here. So basically when he's talking about investigating things, he's not just talking about investigating things in any random ways you want. Okay, because a thing, even just a simple object like a laptop, which is not a simple object, a uh, simple object as a vase, we have a million ways of talking about it, right? Um, but then, no, he has a program here. You have to think about the coherence of a vase. Okay, then what's a coherence? It's, the original word is Li. <laughs> so I assume people like Yvonne has heard about this before. You, you're probably not prepared to translate it into coherence. Because in modern Chinese language, and basically it's, it's a very extremely commonly seen word. Normally people see that as principle, okay, or pattern, okay? I have a reason why I translate it as Li. I'm not the only person. I belong to a group of scholars who translate the Li into coherence. Partly because of the really extremely rich metaphysical meanings that it hosts um, that I'm going to explain. Because principle, in a way, is very empty. What principle? You, you know, it could be anything. In, in a way, it doesn't, it's, it's clear, but it's not informative. Coherence really points to the central meaning of Li as being valuable and intelligible ways that things fit together. Okay? For instance, a chair has a coherence there. Because it has, you know, the, the structure of the chair with the four legs and how the legs fit with the, the sitting part and then the back, that makes a good chair. The, 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 the functional condition, of the, the structure of that functional condition of the chair is the coherence of the Li, okay? Is how the different parts fit with one another. And so is the base. Uh, you know, it's a simple structure and yet it's coherent, right? It's, and then there are things we can say about how it, how the different parts fit together, right? And now we can say the humans as well. For instance, this, there's coherence in this room at this moment. For the simple fact that while I'm talking, no one, no one of you are talking at the same time. Because, you know, it's, it's not that, it's, 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 it's the unstated or accepted, you know, rule that if, if we are, are participating in a lecturing activity, then we take turns to speak. Right? That's the coherence. And also, some of you, you know, you, your relationship with your children is the coherence. Like the way, the, there are ways in which you communicate and interact with your children that you find most um, appropriate, endearing, and affectionate, and all the, you know, positive words you may apply to your family, then that's all coherence. Yeah, and, and if a familial con uh, uh, you know, connection goes out of coherence, you will feel it. <coughs> Say if your children talk to you in a way that is not usual, and then you will sense it, right? And then you would react in a certain way. So then we're really talking about valuable in the sense, th as the way I just described, that we're not just talking about random ways people, uh, things, per put together. We're talking about the patterns that we invested in with value as humans. And then they're also intelligible to us in the sense that none of this is mysterious, okay? The vase, the table, your family members, they're all really real things in, in, your, in, 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 your, uh, in your personal world. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, I, mm. because you brought that up, mm. when something lacks coherence, like you can't communicate, What's that? Then that's not real? Okay. 
we're going to get to that in point four, OK? Um, so let, yeah, why don't I talk about point four now? Because that's obviously a question. So the, the concept Li itself is combines the descriptive and the normative in the sense that it, it stands for a, what a thing is and what it ought to be. So this is not to deny that there are co incoherences in the world, but it, it is a word that is prescriptive and normative in the sense that it stands as a norm. So that chair would, that's a coherent chair. And then, but we also have, you know, chairs which are, you know, you know, they're not suitable, they're not well made and then not suitable to be sold as a commodities. So that would be an example of that. But this is not to say that there is existence of a chairly coherence that is there. That some chairs are indeed that way, and those that should be the way in which all the chairs ought to be. Okay, all right. So it's not just a description, but it's also an, a normative uh, um, existence. Okay. Um, all right. And then going back to this point, um, one and many. I think this should be familiar to any of you who have have any encounter with Greek philosophy. Um, so, but, but it, I'm not going into too much depth here because it's going to be time consuming. Uh, one thing I would say, yes, it's similar in the sense that it's everything has a coherence. And then the coherences of distinctive things come to unifying one grand coherence. So when we are talking about the term, it's a, in other words, it's a universal. Okay, it's not a descriptive. It's not a description of ad hoc random things. It is, but in the meantime, it is also a scheme which combines these specific coherences into one grand coherence. Okay, but uh, one thing I want to emphasize here, just for a uh, brief note here, is it's different from the Greek one and many problems in the sense that it's not as the general principles versus specifics. So it's not a procedure of abstraction. So we are, if you're talking about you know, an idea, a platonic ideal of light, for instance, that's a universal that is abstract in nature. And then you, we talk about all sorts of things, such as the lamp or my computer screen that has lights. These are specifics that can be abstracted in a way to go into a unitary ideal, ideal of, of lightness. It's not the case here. We're not talking about deduction, induction, and all that. Um, so basically, the basic, the, so, but how did it come into one then? It's basically through global interconnectivity. Okay, this it gets a little bit. Just see how much um, you, you find this relevant. Um, because one thing connects to another, and then another, infinitely across the world. So any coherence, you know, we, we start with the coherence of chair, and then we talk about the relationship between Yvonne and the chair because this is another coherent relationship. And then and we'd be extending to another coherence that has to do with Yvonne and the institute because she's a member here. And then we talk about the institute and the city of Santa Barbara. You know, see what I mean here? And then the, the so by acknowledging the global interconnectivity by starting at any specific point, that will be the one and many scheme here. Okay, and then again, this came from Indian philosophy, Indra's net. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about this really shining, you know, web of gems. But in each gem, you find one and a many. This is actually, yeah. Th then again, this Buddhist influence. All right. So the last point is that it's both immanent and transcendent, which is a way to say that. It's always in our world, okay? It's never really up there in heaven with God. Every coherence we're talking about is completely embedded in our experience with us in the same sphere as us, okay? But why is it also transcendent? This here, the transcendence is in a weak sense, in the sense that it's going beyond our sensory perception of things, okay? Some, some coherence might, you know, the chair coherence, I, I can see it. In a way, it's a sensory perception. But there, there are many coherent relationships that you, know, you need to go beyond the sensory perception to reach it. So there's this weak sense of transcendence, but not strong. strong a strong sense of transcendence means that 
you know, there are separate realms, uh, two different ontological realms. Like God is one in one realm that is above us, and then we are in the in a different realm. And while we depend on God, God doesn't depend on us. That's a separation, very clear. Okay, there's no separation here because we can't really talk about any coherence unless we're in this phenomenal world. Yes. Quick question: If somebody was sitting in the chair, right? Would that give it more coherence? That would be a different coherence, <laughs> right? So it's all connected, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a good question because that, in a way, is even more valued coherence from the human's point of view. Because we're really talking about the human chair relationship, right? And we value the chair because we want to sit on it. That's precisely the point of that furniture, I'm afraid. Yeah. OK, it, indeed, it, it centers the humans. We, we can criticize that. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm a, yeah, it's, that's a different, that's a separate philosophical issue. But uh, is it, does it make sense to you? OK, good, good, you guys are great. This is difficult, by the way. Um, this is, this, even, even my colleagues in China studies, at UCSV, for instance, there's, there could be seasoned scholars in other studies of you know, areas of China studies. They, it, not all of them can sit through a lecture on this because it's, it is a very highly challenging concept. But I'm so glad this is well received here. All right. Now I explain what things are, and then I go on to explain what coherences of things are because that really is the subject of investigation here, right? Now let's come back to the precept itself, which is investigating things and extending knowledge. Now with this profound understanding of the key sound concepts, now I think we're ready to embrace what's unique about this, this, this thesis regarding knowledge, okay? Um, for one, to start with, we don't know that for one, it's a process. It's not a simple or single mode. Okay, it's not just sensory knowing for sure, but it's also not just you know some higher form of learning that is not grounded in our understanding, you know, sensory knowing of the world. Rather, it's a combination of both. Okay, going back to the example of the chair, you know, we, I. You know, I understand its existence via my senses, but then I also have the higher knowledge of how it can, you know, cohesive, become a cohesive part of the universe in, in various ways. And that would be my understanding, my in investigation of the coherence of the chair, right? So, but as you can tell, I always have a clear focus on the latter. I start with my senses, but I aim for higher. Okay, so that's the first characteristics. And the second characteristics, then again, going back to the subject object thing. One of you have mentioned that, oh, this also has to be inner outer. Indeed, indeed, because we tend to see ourselves as a container of subjectivity, right? Anything that is external to ourselves would be in the outer world. Um, and then the, this thesis actually aims to bridge that distinction. How? Okay, because in a way, it's, it's undisputed. It would be ridiculous to say there is no inner outer is this distinction. That would be ridiculous, absurd, right? It, you know, if 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 you know, I accept the fact that I'm an entity myself, that there is boundary between myself and other things, um, and then there has to be a distinction play in place. How is that bridged? It has to do with coherence. OK, so imagine, then again, it goes back to how we understand coherence. It could be, in the way I just explained it, that you know, via propositional knowledge, that I break it down into statements and arguments, say, this chair comes in this form with four legs in a way that is balanced out by the seating part of it, and then is made of a certain material that makes it endurable and and, and suitable for sitting. That's one way of doing it, but that's not the right way of doing it. Okay, or the, the desirable way of doing it. The more desirable way of doing it is to acknowledge one another on the basis of our common embeddedness in the universe 
and let that, let that coherence resonate with my heart and mind. Okay? Remember the heart and mind is you know, connected to nature, and then nature, human nature is further connected to the cosmos. So the proposition here is that all this cosmic order has already, in one way or another, they are available here in your nature. You just, and then, but it's either adulterated or becomes dominant, and then you have to have a way to activate it. So it's in a way, it's not something, it's something that is already available to us, but then, you know, just take some effort to, 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 re, to revive that, that, that sort of, that sort of connection, right? So this is why the subject object the distinction has to go in the sense that you, we have to put our, the knower and the known in this globally interdependent uh, cos cosmology and then have, you know, let the coherence resonate with the heart and mind in a matter that resembles an ecological transaction r rather than a monological inquiry that is, you know, focuses on one subjectivity and then make everything else the objects of that subjectivity. Okay, um, so this may all sounds really, really mysterious. It's not, but uh, you know, then again, going back to my example here, I see that chair, I go sit right in there in a, in a, in a manner that I, in a s comfortable and stable manner. That actually is my good understanding of coherence in terms of a human chair relationship and also a coherent structure of the chair. Because I already intuitively grasp the idea, oh, that's a, that's a good chair to sit in, and this is the right way of sitting in it. And I've done that without even thinking about any of that. So in a way, this is a resonant process. I'm using this process, you may, it, it may sound a little bit too easy to you, because it's too daily life, like lo looking at a chair and then sit on it. That's, it's, just, it's too easy for anyone. But, but I hope just to see, you know, this is actually, this is exactly what the point is about. So I'm giving a more elaborate example so you see the utility of this. You know, we all value people who make other people comfortable in their presence. Right, is that, can, we, can I say that? <laughs> yeah, one, one, one type of people who like to be, befriend is really we feel comfortable in their presence. Right? That's exactly what this is about. Because those people, they, it's not necessary because they're smarter than other people or they're richer or whatever merits you can credit them with. It's, it's really they're effortless in terms of you know, conducting harmonious interpersonal relationships with other people. Without having to thinking about it, without having to pretending, without having even to make an effort. She's just, you know, intuitively good at it, that make you feel good about ourselves and you know, make the conversations flow and all that. That is coherence. Okay, that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So a person like that enters in the room, she immediately, immediately gets everything, she immediately does everything in the in an appropriate sense without even having to try. That's, that's exactly because she's not so aware of her own existence, like I am here. Here are people. These are the correct ways of doing relationships. These are the chairs for them to sit on. Then if you do that, then it's, it's, it will be the opposite of how you f why you feel good about a, an effortless person I was just describing, right? So it's all ecological transactions with an acknowledgement to our common embeddedness in the universe versus that subject and everything else objects. <laughs> all right? Does that make sense? Good. Um, so uh, a third point here is that, then again, this is a, it's a saliently sort of anti-Buddhist stance, is that he really mentioned, he really emphasizes this has to be cumulative, it has to be gradual, incremental, instead of, um, um, of, of, of a sudden moment of enlightenment. Um, so it, it, in a way, this is also didactic, didactic in the sense that he's a teacher, he wants his students to work hard. Um, so, uh, so f there are two, I think, two interesting points here is the, the one, he strongly discouraged students from like brooding over what a unitary Lee might be or unitary coherence might be. Because in a way, that's the convenient way. You know, if, if it's one and a many, right? If I get the one and then I get all of them. 
and, 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 but uh, it could be a shortcut. Uh, but then the, Zhu Xi basically argues that it's not, it's not going to get you anywhere. And you're just going to just be anxious, make you anxious and, and uncomfortable. And, and it's unproductive. You really just should be focusing on your piecemeal efforts. Okay? And where are the piecemeal efforts? It's everywhere in your daily life. So that's another point. So we're not talking about doing the homework. Like I'm doing a project today, and you know, talk, thinking about coherence. We're talking about just living my life today. You know, driving my car, going grocery shopping. You know, talking to my neighbor, walking my dog. You know, all, all the small things in which everything has coherence, and that would be your chance and context to to fathom the coherences. Do that. So that's what Zhu Xi suggests. Okay, and there's nothing mysterious about it. Then, then again, this is very neo confusion or confusion in general. You, it's, you, you know, you, if, if any people find this, you know, how do we get there? Is this supposed to be magical? Or they would say no, because it's, it's, it's all about exactly how you conduct your daily life in your own way, in, in the ways in which that you perceive, you, not, you in, instinctively perceive to be natural and productive. Okay? All right. Force and the last characteristics. <laughs> this is when we talk about spontaneity. Okay, so that goes back to the uh, the, the opening point I made. Um, the ultimate goal here is spontaneous sagacity, um, and then in his own words, it will be unimpeded interconnection. Okay, so I hope now yes. Um, I did not actually uh, define sagacity in a way that is specific to neo-Confucianism. I think it's just you know it, what the word means in general: moral goodness and skillful. It's it's a combination of moral goodness and skillful competence um, 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 that in in the moral context. So so in a way that is you going back to my example of. Being a say, uh, the, the effortless person I was just describing, I often just use that example to, to college students and I ask them, how many of you want to be a sage today? Nobody raised their hands. And then I, how many, uh, and then I ask, how many of you want to you know, wake up in the morning, feel good about yourselves, you know, going to the dining hall and enjoying your breakfast and seeing your friends and seeing all your friends are so happy around you. And then going to classes, answer all the questions and uh, correctly, and basically just doing everything correctly um, and appropriately without even have to thinking about it. And they all raise their hands. <laughs> That's what sagacity is, <laughs> right? But the whole point is is spontaneous, right? Because it's we can all strive to good, do good and be good in every way I was just describing. But if you have to strive in every occasion. That is just laborious. And then people would argue it's not practical, because any moral philosophy that requires a person to be perfect in every sense and to work at every little thing you do in life would not be well received, I guess. But the whole point is that you have to be spontaneous. Yes? Well, I, you know, that was easy and difficult to follow one another. So you know, the extending knowledge. So mm -hmm. in order to be spontaneous, mm -hmm. You know, it's levels, right? I mean, you you have to work to be spontaneous. Indeed, yes, yes. So that goes to that's exactly. So it's then again it goes back. The previous point is that it's not about a sudden mode of enlightenment. It's a piecemeal incremental pr pr process where you work on your daily life. So it's we cannot. It's not an argument that say everybody could just arrive at the condition of having spontaneous. Sagacity and then lived happily after. Happily after, it's it's a constantly arriving situation. There you are, you are aspiring to to the to the as as part of the procedure rather than arrived and then done with. Right? Yes. Just like let's say you are students in class when they are mm -hmm. studying. At first, it's very difficult. But you know. Hmm. And then later on, when the course is finished and they understand, it's spontaneous, isn't it? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's that, that's why that learning idea, is. You know? That's why knowing is important. Going back to this, you know, that's, you know, we spent the past 50 minutes talking about why knowing is at the center. There you go. Uh, you, it takes, uh, you know, the procedure of being a student. Yeah, indeed. But now we can put this in a more concrete terms because we just introduced the, the idea of coherence to you. So why is that someone is able to act appropriately in all and any situations? It's because she's able to be in constant accord with any and all coherences. Okay, so, that's, so now we have a more concrete way of framing this goodness. Um, and then of course, and then the next point is how I define effortless and spontaneity, which is basically means involves little mental exertion of any kind. You don't have to debate yourself. You don't even have to think about it. Going back to my example, I see the wallet here, I return it right away. There's very little mental activities involved in the, the process. That's the best. But then if I have to debate, oh, that's a wallet. <laughs> Should I take it, right? Um, and then I return it. You, you see, that's, I think the, the, the difference is pretty obvious here. Um, and I do think the neo-confusions speak in a way that is in, in close accord with, with our experience of the world that is still very much relevant today. That will be my lecture today. Yes, and I welcome further questions. <laughs> Yes. But the yeah. question I have with that mm. spontaneity is spontaneity doesn't mean mindless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean mindless, does it? Indifference. Uh, no, that's why I want to define it as little exertion involved. But because there must be some intelligence. I mean, it's not just simply blind thing happening. No, 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 it's not indifference. So it's not that I don't care about anything. That's why I can do anything any way I want. But then again, it wouldn't actually be coherent then. I mean, you may accidentally get you know, good, good for one thing or another, but a mindless, indifferent person with no engagement actually is the, the opposite of that. This is when the engagement gets so deep and profound that you would lose this is basically about losing self-centeredness. Okay? It's not about giving up, giving up on thinking and consideration. It's about not thinking about, not centering yourself in the whole procedure, but dive into the stream of the shared experience in the universe that you shared with all other peoples and, and animals and, and, and things. Yes? Um, going back to Lee, when we studied Lee many years ago, <clears throat> it was presented as a kind of virtue or a propriety that one learn, had to learn how to mm -hmm. um, act with propriety right. in ways that you've, you've helped elaborate terrifically. Um, and then that was seen as a way to build up a culture, uh, to build up a society that had stability and harmony. But, and so that's the way, and from what we hear, mm -hmm. you know, that still is there in Chinese society and others. But what about dissent? Because obviously all around the world right now, mm -hmm. there are a large number of people who are in dissent mm -hmm. with their system. Right, yeah, yeah. And so, how do you can you can you just say no no dissent we got to go along with the program <clears throat> and the tradition and all uh -huh. that yeah or can you build dissent into an even you know little rebellion and you know street protests all the rest can mm -hmm. you build dissent mm -hmm. into the concept of Lee okay. Thank you. For one, there are different Li's. So because of the Chinese language, you're talking about the ritual Li. So the, it's, it's the same romanization, but it's a highly different um, character. It's a different, it's a different concept. So that means ritual priority, uh, pr propriety. Uh, it basically means, you know, in extreme, I would, I would not actually subscribe to that definition, but in extremely um, uh, simple and quick way of defining it, it could be understood as norms. Um, as, as contractual relationships um, that s would stabilize a community or a society. And, and, and in a way, if it's been wedded to political authorities or power in that sense, it became, it became the norms. 
it becomes the uh, the rules and the criteria that individuals would be would be bound to would be regulated with. So that's that's a different lead. Um, and then here, this is the lead. This is a, just a different concept. And also, I want to emphasize that neo Confucians have a a long history of being dissenters in Chinese history. <laughs> so they, these guys, they're mainstream, they're, they're, they're straight male and all that. They are, they are the norms in a way. Um, uh, they're, they are the majority of the society. They, hold, they, hold, they uphold cultural authority. But they, uh, for at least several hundreds of years, these people, they separate themselves from the political authority. So they argue that there is a, what they have is the lineage of the way. Okay, that's the way is important, versus the lineage of the rulers. And they argue that you guys are doing your job, you know, running a state and all that. You, I, I respect that you have the authority, but we actually have the higher authority here because we understand, you know, how this culture, the lineage of Confucian culture has been, you know, continued in the past thousands of years. So, uh, so in the medieval, in the times I study, for instance, Zhu Xi, for instance, uh, now he's been, you know, revered by us in such a manner that it's so important that he's number one in the intellectual world and the, the sort of intellectual hero to to look up to. But for the majority of his life, he's he served in minor ranking positions in the government and was banished uh, several times because of the things he said. The emperor wasn't happy with him for a really long time <laughs> until very late. And then, in fact, um, the. Now we call this mainstream philosophy, but for a long while they, they were considered as being um, a, a problematic and troublemakers, um, and, and it became integrated into the political agenda as the mainstream several hundred years after his death. So we, we're really talking about different versions of this, and then responding to your questions, it definitely shows the it's not just the potentiality, it's what they did for a long while is to pr produce dissent. Because the combination of normative and descriptive actually affords the type of philosophical space to, to give everybody. If you think about coherence, one out of many, daily life and all that, it's a very democratic-minded program. But basically, you are listening to yourself. You're, there is no authority in this room that has, would be warranted by the system and say, there has to be a master in the room, everybody listen to him. It's basically giving everybody say, you have the nature which is perfect, connected to heaven, and then you go figure out. It's your daily life. Go grocery shopping, taking classes, talking to your neighbors, finding out coherences out there. Yeah? So this mm -hmm. can be, is consistent with this whole mode oh, of yeah. investigating. Oh, yeah. They're, they're the machine <laughs> of producing dissents. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of references to the way, mm -hmm. which may be called the Tao, but I'm not sure. Uh, and as you mentioned, that could be an ultimate source of Li, if I understood correctly. Mm -hmm. Could you say a bit more about, mm. is this the Tao Te Ching's influence on Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism? Uh, uh -huh. Any more you could say about the Taoism. way as the source, right? Because it's very dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah, um, the, the, that's true because it, you know it's called Taoism. That's why when normally when people talk about the Tao or the way, which is the translation of the Tao, people will be thinking of Taoism instead, in, in, instead of Confucianism. Uh, but I guess it's it's a fair point um, to make that. The way indeed is the common inspiration between Taoism and Confucianism since very ancient times. So they both, they don't, the Confucians don't, don't even borrow the term from Taoism. They just started using the term. But then, of course, their programs are different. Um, but one commonality I would like to mention, also I think this is more of a, what Taoism is really good at, uh, while it remains the inspiration on the Confucianism side, it would be the spontaneous part. Because the Confucians, as you can tell, they're not really that spontaneous, I have to say. That's why I said, you know, kind of sided with Buddhism for that, or Taoism for that matter. They still try, you know, they try to make you work, you know, they're, you know, they try to make you take tests and become an officials and all that. Um, but they, but then, you know, as you can tell, they have the goal of spontaneity right there as, as, as a sort of almost as an elevated framework of giving meanings to all we do. 
and how we do better in these actions. But the DAO is really depends on you know what time period time period we're talking about. But the Asian Taoism they're really just chill. The spontaneous spontaneous argument really is is a very straightforward um, de deviance away from the you know the you know the, the exertions that the Confucians engage in their life. Yeah, but then again, I would say it's it's the, none of them monopolize the term the way. Um, there is there is a connection though. Yes, please. Just another. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for these ideas. Now, um, when you mentioned Jin Zhu Zizi, and that knowing and knowledge is a gradual process, yes, and that it involves the this whole process of knowing mm -hmm. and knowing by virtue, and at the same time we're saying forget yourself. There's a sort of a state of being at one with the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So the question is about this middle range. For those of us who mm. don't know, would like to know, mm -hmm. and believe that you can know, mm. but then there's the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in, in things like Buddhism, you have paramitas, or you know, virtues that you can train on. Mm. If one is training in this, in this methodology, mm. What, how do we gain virtue? What are the things we think about? How do we go about that? Mm. Is there a kind of mm. discipline, if you will? Anything you mm. could do with that? Thank you. This is from the internet or from you? <laughs> I am the internet. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> so you're in one body me. with the it's internet. <laughs> oh, it's from you. OK, thank you. Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, so if I understand that question correctly, you're asking, um, the, the way is a constant aspiration, a matter of aspiration rather than a matter of fact for most of us, which is a fair point, right? Which is to say, none of us can really self-claim, self-profess to be a sage. I mean, you can do it, but it wouldn't, you know, it, then, you know. It would be it, coherent. <laughs> or, you know, yeah, but, yeah, you, you, someone can try it. Uh, you know, the, 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 Juicy, for instance, wouldn't ca call himself a sage, but for other reasons. Uh, but, but so would, the, would it still mean anything if we're kind of, the, you know, struggling in the middle? Like, like the middle is, is in between, uh, okay, I became, I, I acknowledge this theory versus achieving the way that we're all like struggling in between. How, yeah, mm -hmm. the distinction between mm -hmm. how and math that you talked about, you know, where uh -huh. that it exists is not, a, it's not much of a question. Mm -hmm. How to do it right. requires right. a lot. Right. In, in, what in what the, is that? Knowing. That's, the, that's actually, that's a very nice way of framing what I'm talk, talking about. Knowing, extending knowledge, understanding coherence, live my life well. So if I, you know, I, you know, I make a new friend today in the audience and I, you know, had a conversation with them, that's part of my, you know, generating knowledge of some coherence today. And then I may have screwed up the conversation, said something stupid. And then and 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 and, and, and fail to make that new friend. That's okay. I still learned something. Next tomorrow, I'm meeting a new person. I try to rectify what I've done. Uh, or you know, I go home. I walk my dog, and she's upset with me because I will disappear for hours. And, um, and then and I try to do something right. So and then you know, really, it's about. And then you know, I try to clean my house and all these different things I do in my daily life. I I. I'm attentive to it, so that's the opposite of it being indifferent. By the way, I engage. I use, I, you know, I, to, I, you know, concentrate my stream of, you know, you know, you know, cognitive, cognitive awareness towards what I do, and constantly self-rectify, exploring the coherence. Then again, it's not about following a rule. The going back to Caroline's question. It's, it's easy if somebody, higher authority, hands out your book of rules and say, do everything in accordance. I have a rule for everything. <laughs> That's the opposite of that. It takes, that basically is asking yourself to explore. There's some guidance indeed. For instance, you know, there are existing accounts on co what's, what, what's coherent. Uh, an easy example would be filial piety, for, which is famous for Chinese culture, for instance. Uh, but filial piety, I have to say, is a res it's a process of, of reciprocity. So it's not just asking a young person to obey their parents, 
or to be respectful, but also actually sometimes with greater emphasis that the parent has to fulfill their role as a parent in the form of uh, performing their parental obligations well. So and then, so and then in in that sense, it's 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 actually not a rule in the sense that you're my child, you're supposed to listen to me. Right? You, I have a rule for you. You have to obey it. But rather, it's about you know talking to your child, and then you know if there is a challenge you want to overcome, and then talk to them and see if you can figure it out in a way that make both of you happy. That's an exploration of a coherence. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Ivan, please. Tough question, please. <laughs> yeah, I have some. <clears throat> Feeling about spontaneous inspire. Yeah. Feeling is good. Uh, I'm glad someone mentioned you're saying that mm. make pe other people comfortable, then right. people will be your good friend. Okay. So I was thinking about mm. uh, spontaneous. Mm. If I want to stand up, it's a very spontaneous action. Right. I don't have to think about, because um, mm. a neurologist tell me to stand up, you actually activate mm. many nerves. If you think about how to stand up, you cannot stand up. <laughs> right. So I think what the spontaneous here is something, when you after a stroke, you cannot stand up then you might have to learn and do a lot of things. Right, exactly. So we talk about as a mm. person, we growing up, we get a lot of right. influence, good right. influence and right. bad influence. So you might lose your ability to, mm. be a, to be able to be friend with others because you got other things influence. You don't, mm -hmm. you have think about all kinds of things before you make a friend. Right. You have Indeed. other functions, other right. desire. Right. So I think this investigating things and understanding knowledge is try not to, you try to investigate the right way so you, connect, you, you talk right. about we connected with the Cosmo or maybe the Tao. Right, the Tao right, right. all in our heart. Right. So we need to make ourselves mm. not be, mm. e not be errands or think of other bad things. My English is not very good. Not, not as oh, no, 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 I think that's a good, do. really good question. Yeah. So if, 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 my, if I may uh, rephrase it in the way I understood it. So say we we're talking about the same scenario of making a friend and having a friendly conversation. But an able-bodied person would do it in a way that is much more effortlessly than a person who su suffers some kind of injury mm -hmm. or or, 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 or physical challenges. So in a way, we don't really have one norm, one like, uh, you know, one norm of the same content for a able-bodied person versus a person who's, who who suffered a stroke. Yeah. That yeah. That I think that's a good point. That's actually it, in a way the uh, neo-Confucianism definitely has the space. They make the space for, um, for spontaneity in the sense that it's. It's it's then it's not a normative system as I just mentioned. It does not have explicit rules. That's why it does not. I can't just hand you a menu and say do this and that and be good. It's all about exploring. So in the sense that the person who had a stroke, who suffered from the consequence of a stroke, may it may take a longer, you know, process or further efforts to talk to their friends and get them to understand the new situation they are in and then you know create in join hands a new ways in which they could communicate and continue their friendships or do activities do things together um, and that's a new coherence and then that takes you know more exploration and extending of the knowledge when i think about a stroke mm. is as you living uh, growing up, right. you can't, you think wrong, you think in a devious way, that means you make yourself have a stroke. But in one way, you, 
you mm. try not to have a stroke as you investigate things mm. and extend your knowledge so that you don't mm. get a stroke. Mm. Can we do that? Like Confucius saying <laughs> what he, mm. I think a book you recommend me to read is very, I, I enjoy it very much. It's mm. Fingerettes uh, about right, Confucius, right. about right. ritual. The ritual as a person growing up has know how to do everything, know the ritual, then you cultivate yourself and mm. you how, how, how you can, I'm trying to connect your confusion with Confucius thinking. Mm -hmm. I that's think okay. that's one yeah, thing, right, yeah, one yeah. way of yeah. investigating things, right, to follow, right, exactly. the lead, right. follow the ritual. Right. Yeah. So going back to your point, you think we can avoid having a critical medical situation such as a stroke by studying neo-Confucianism? No, you you need you know if you don't uh -huh. go you don't investigate things right to extend your knowledge you are liable to suffer, suffer a stroke. Uh, <laughs> preventative medicine we're talking about. Or? I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to explain it. Yeah, is. but you sometimes it's just pure bad luck. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it could be a matter of luck. People get a stroke. We got sick. No, what I mean, not really strong. Mm. Uh, comparatively, in life, you oh, get a stroke. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You sure, let sure. In Calamities, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Influence yeah. by right. bad, in bad influences. Right, right, indeed. Like, I wear a mask whenever I teach 500 students. I think that, you know, I think it makes sense to me because, you know, I, every week I still respond to students who came down with COVID. Um, I could get sick. And then by doing this, I may not get sick as quickly as I might. Yes. Because we mm. live in this society, you mm. need two person before you can mm. have yourself. If only by yourself, you cannot live. You have no, so the, the Confucius Ren is a person with right. Right. two strokes. Right. That yeah. means you always to have to interact mm. with other people. Right. But how do we interact? Mm -hmm. Instead of the juicy say investigate things, Con uh, Confucius talk about Li. Mm. I think Li is very important. Right. The ritual between yeah, two right. people, you right. start have Li. So you have to cultivate yourself right. how to interact. Right. with other people. Right. This is a really good point because selfhood, this is also acknowledged in other philosophical studies as well. S selfhood or identity, because we talk, about, we talk about identity a lot in today's world, really is a product of transaction. Mm -hmm. so, so we would not care to identify ourselves if we're alone in our own room. Like I wouldn't, it wouldn't even occur to me like, what is my name and this is what I like, this is the way I prefer doing things. These are the, these are the, the, the identity making or the definition of selfhood would only transpire when we are at least in the company of another human being. Because that's when it becomes necessary that selfhood needs to be announced and defined. And that who I am by all these identity markers became necessary, indeed. So that's why, um, it's, I think Ivan makes a really nice point here is that it goes back to my point of not you know, subscribing to the subject object model here. While we're looking at investigating things, extending knowledge as if it's an act by one person, it's never just you know, centered on one individual. It's always actually something that we do in an interpersonal context or inter, in their words, it would be inter thing contact because you know, things include humans. Yes, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eva. Donna, please. It, it was just another example. It, it's a story, a Buddhist story, I believe, and I think people here may know it better than I do. But it's the idea that uh, a man, an ordinary person, is walking down a road, a path, perhaps returning from work at the end of the day, a well-used path, and <clears throat> he sees a banana peel in the road, hmm. and he looks at it, and he just totally ignores it and walks on. The next person that comes along sees the banana peel, mm -hmm. thinks about it, mm -hmm. thinks, well, is there some advantage in my picking that banana peel up and removing it so someone else isn't hurt? And he figures, well, no, and he moves on. Mm -hmm. The next person comes along and maybe considers this karma, you know, like, well, what can I gain from mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. 
And so he picks it up and throws it aside, but he's doing it from the point of view of self-interest. Mm -hmm. The sage passes along, mm -hmm. picks up the banana peel, mm -hmm. kicks it aside without ever moving his mind mm -hmm. from that perfect unity right, exactly. that, ex that is acting on behalf of the whole. Right. It, it seems like that's a, a good lesson for a lot of this, the mm. path to knowing that you've been Yeah, that's a good, thank about. you. That is an excellent example. That's exactly what I'm getting at. So it's really a moral act without having to thinking about it is the best kind of moral act. And it's a long path. It's, it's a long path, path indeed, path. right. <laughs> yeah, this, I, I, yeah I, I would love to. If, if I have put this idea in your head, the next time, I'm sure all of you do a lot of good deeds in your lives. <laughs> but pay attention to the procedure, the mental procedure leading to that act. Do you, do you actually think about anything? Do you do thinking at all? Do you have any considerations? You know, it's a test. Um, no, 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 but, but then if you don't actually feel any exertions in your head before you know, preceding that action, you're a sage. That's my point. That's the new confusion point. Like that stage, being a sage, is, a, is an act of discovering that unity, right. which is there. That's so why investigating things. brings everything to harmony. Right, and indeed. It's always there. Right, so right, right. Exactly. Going away from the self um, egotistic right. perspective. Exactly, yes. Thank you. That's a beautiful, beautiful note, notation on what I just said. Thank Question you. from the internet. Oh, but, yeah. Really? Yes. OK. And I, actually. Uh, and this is from our good friend Marlon. And he says about sagacity. OK. Uh, he says, an actor can empathetically understand and perform a okay. character. Mm -hmm. A sage knows what to say or do when interacting with a character and what the results will be. Mm -hmm. Is that sagacity? Uh, it's the question to orient towards the actor? Oh, I'll read it again. Okay. A an actor can empathetically understand and perform a character. Right. A sage knows what to say or do when interacting with the character right. and what the results will be. Is that sagacity? So th th that's my question. It, it's what's, there is an actor and the sage, and uh, assume that the co the question wants to contrast these two. It seems so. Right. So in a way, it, it, it's the question about the performance of the actor. That you know, the a moral act could be either a genuine one, uh, you know, done by a sage or performed by an actor who n understands performance. Seems like that. Okay. That's actually a great question because this is where feeling emotion, I actually didn't really get a lot of chance to talk about it. I'm actually an expert on history of emotions. I love talking about feelings. Um, one assumption of Confucianism is that um, you know, virtues, you know, genuine virtues actually involves the alignment of feelings in the sense that you just feel it's right. And, that's, and, and normally we, we describe that as, as a minor auxiliary point because you really want to reason it in the correct way. But then you say, oh, so it feels right to me. Uh, but it's actually it's feeling right actually as the heart of Neo-Confucianism or Confucianism. So just to give you one example, this is from classical Confucianism, which Yvonne just invoked. An extremely e famous example is that um, a child, so, so the argument, the story is that a child is about to fall into a well. This is in the eight classical times. And then anyone who passes by wouldn't help lend, you know, extending his hand to help the child. So basically, the big, for, we, we don't want to say it's universal, but for the majority of the people, their action would be trying to help. Oh, look, that child is about to fall. They would just, without any thinking, they would be extending their hands and try to get, her, get the child out of the well, right? So that is an argument that is so fundamental to Confucianism to argue that actually morality is really about feeling right. Because nobody in that situation would even have the time to think. And yet most people are, make the, the same decision, which is, is to help. And that is just to show you that the most important foundation and criteria of a moral ethical behavior really resides in your feelings. So that's why the alignment of feeling and your 
you know, other intellectual activities such as thinking is so important to the core of morality in the sense. So I would, I would not, because I'm, I'm aware of the performative aspect of emotion, but it's, when we talk about emotion, it's never that simple. We can never separate performance from a authentic emotive core or whatever binary we want to make here. I'll give you another example, for instance. Um, if a funeral is a, a taking place across the street, and then I don't know that person at all, the person who passed away, and I don't know any of their family members or friends, I'm a completely stranger to that occasion. Okay? I have zero, you know, rationally speaking, I have zero reason to feel sad for the person who passed away. But if I stand close enough and observe, you know, their, you know, the sadness and the shedding of tears of his family and friends for a while, and then most people actually could, you, you, there's a couldn't help moment that you would be enveloped into the sadness that you somehow feel you're resonating with them, and some people even could be moved into tears, and then you know, and then you could be mysterious. You're like, why am I even crying? Because I don't even know this person. Right? So, so in a way, that's, that's the, my point here is, you know, emotion actually is such a, it's, it's a very inclusive and, and broad existence that is, it, even though we understand that it, it is susceptible to manipulation of performance or any of the more artificial ap, uh, 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 efforts, you can never separate them very cleanly, like in a clean, clean and clear fashion that this is just performance versus this is genuine. Thank you. uh, You're welcome. I have a question. Where time is short, but I I just wondered. I probably could work this out, but you might be able to help. Uh, thinking about this whole orientation towards, like, if one is a philosopher, metaphysics, or one's involved in scientific inquiry, um, where one's abstracted in some sense from interpersonal relationships. Of course, it. It relates. Mm -hmm. How that relates to coherence in, in the Tao. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the example here? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, if you're involved mm -hmm. in philosophical or metaphysical right. thought. Right. Or scientific inquiry. Right. Yeah. Right. So how, how does the scientific inquiry fit into the, the yeah. neo-confusion model? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, um, the, under the ausp auspices of new Confucianism, numerous scientists emerged in medieval and early modern China. So basically, oh, in other words, anyone who can be credited as a scientist or innovative engineer uh, was a neo Confucian. <laughs> Because that's what you study, right? It's, if you're a well-educated man who's interested in advanced learning, no matter it's science or what, that you study neo-confusionism. So in a way, this is probably that assumption doesn't exist in this room, which is nice. Um, but for some younger students who have learned a little bit about China and then may just assume that you know, this is completely anti-science because it's all about ethics and moral knowledge. That is not true because if you happen to remember um, knowing from hearing seeing is an important category in, in this enterprise. Well, sensory perception indeed is the foundation of, of, of science, if, modern, if not modern science. So that's why my book actually uh, is about this person who is somehow amazingly a scientist with all these discoveries um, at least several hundred years ahead of Europe like discover so many different like physical things like mathematics and physics and all that. He's a neo confusion on the one hand, on the other hand, writes all these important things about astronomy, physics, and mathematics. So in a way, the, the indeed the kind of it, it it is gravitated towards moral knowledge indeed because it's about you know moral cultivation. But all these attentiveness, the observations. The, the ways of systematic ways of di directing perception can be utilized for a scientific purpose. So, um, but, um, it, but I have to say, though, because of the secondary status of sensory perception has in this theory of knowledge, it was never taken, it, it can be extremely uh, successful as a scientist, like the guy I wrote about, but you, that wouldn't get you to the top position like Juicy has. 
So these people do, neo-Confucians who are scientists do exist, but they are never the mainstream ones. They're, 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 they're famous, but they're never the top guys. So that's, that's just the, you know, what, what happened in history. But then up the, if you think about it, all the astronomical theories, for instance, at the time, a lot of them are good ones, are proposed by neo-Confucians because they like to observe. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Oh, okay. have one more Can question? I say yeah. something? No, 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 behind you. Oh. Oh, didn't you have a question? Oh, no. Any, anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to? Yeah, someone, yeah. Yes, Maybe. please, yeah. Just like, yeah. I've, I've spoken already. Yeah, the, the, uh, the concepts that uh, you explained there, hmm. are, are these Confucius's teachings, or, or, or are they uh, the current um, um, concepts of, of, uh, of Chinese speakers mm -hmm. uh, in Chinese culture mm -hmm. um, and, and the concepts of, of the Chinese language? Mm -hmm. Or are they the uh, explanation of these concepts toward English speakers? Mm -hmm. yeah, so what, what, con what broad, broad context are all these uh, uh, right. explanations in? Right. None of, yeah, that's a great question. So going back to my first slide, actually, is a chronology, if you still remember that. Um, Confucius actually lived in a time period of 500 BCE, which is a, a, almost 2,000, uh, over 1,000 millennium before people like Zhu Xi. None of the concepts I explained today actually are clearly proposed by Confucius. They're are, there are a thousand years apart. But then again, going back to Ivan's comment here, a lot of them you know, have definitely derived from the foundation from classical, uh, classical Confucianism. But then the real metaphysical part I'm introducing today, I think it comes from Buddhism, or at least one effort to refute Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So, and then going back to your uh, question here, and they're still very much alive um, in modern time, in today's world. I mean, not just Chinese speaking, People, but also, you know, I have friends who in this country are claim themselves. I've got a whole bunch of professor friends claim to be Confucian Bostonians or Boston Confucians. I forgot the term. They they are the modern, you know, believers of Confucianism, and these are the things they they talk about. Yeah, it's very much alive today. Uh -huh. And then maybe a little bit about the difference between Chinese mm -hmm. language concepts mm -hmm. and English language concepts. Oh yeah, that's a, what I mean. That's why you know, for instance, how how do I translate Li has become it's a huge scholarly debate lasted for fifty years. Mm -hmm. So people start from laws because it's especially when you know a century ago when the, you know when the, the Westerners first came to understand Chinese philosophy, they were like, oh, maybe it's you know it, it's law, it's the laws of nature or it's it's given by God. You know, it's it's a very literal like marriage between. Um, a Chinese concept to a Christian philosophy, for instance. And then, uh, and then, of course, that was the early stage of understanding Chinese culture. And then there's you know, the more efforts after more further studying, they realize, oh, actually, there's no God or lawgiver involved at all. That's another thing, if you have noticed. We're not talking about any higher authority here. Nobody's in charge of the coherences. Nobody has defined it for you. Um, so, and then they decide, oh, maybe it's principle. And then we were like, principle sounds, could be anything, right? And then another 50 years later, we're now translating this as coherence. It's, it's five books if you want to read about this. So, yeah, but thank you for the question. Okay. Well, I think our time is up. Okay, we're going to need the microphone. And um, just hang on one second. I'll sit down here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll hear a formal thank you for such an unbelievably instructive <laughs> <laughs> lesson. Um, so hang on. But uh, we want to make a few announcements. Um, first of all, as we mentioned, uh, we have a study group uh, which is uh, uh, quite large and very active on Tuesday evenings, uh, 7.30 to 9. And now you can come to the seminar room in the front house or you can um, get you know, go on Zoom and do it from your comfy spot at home. 
Uh, you just email Donna at worldculture.org to get uh, an invitation. And this particular Tuesday, we're doing a, f a focus on education in the month of February. And there's actually um, a list uh, for the first half of the month that you can pick up at the back of the uh, room uh, as you leave. And you can, uh, uh, it's very much a conversational mode, but this Tuesday, we're going to um, spend a little bit of time of trying to, um, well, we're just going to open it to what might be our understanding in an introductory way for Confucianism and Taoism and um, response to what we've heard today. So we do invite you to, to tune in or come enjoy the seminar room that has now been opened. Um, there's a more freedom that is <laughs> happening. Uh, and then on the following week, uh, February 14th, we're going to have a talk and discussion of Montessori methods around the world. And we have in mind also uh, about three more programs on education uh, from a global perspective. So we do invite you uh, to that. Um, our next Saturday forum will be two weeks from today, uh, Saturday, February 18th, from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, it is a form that we were going to present as an opening um, offering in January that got rained out, and it's called International Politics, Transnational Economics, Environmental Crisis, Ethical and Sustainable Choices. So <laughs> it's rather large, but we thought we had to call attention to the various ways in which uh, globalism is working and in ways to some extent that it's not working. I mean, we all now, with constant news and constant suffering that we're looking at. So we were going to try to just at least open uh, some vision and some discussion of the um, political, economic, and environmental um, tr um, activities and problems that, and possibilities that are now, uh, are that we we may want to take very seriously and uh, become very active in our thinking, at least, uh, of being a citizen of the world and the possibilities for an emerging world culture. Uh, see, uh, so we, uh, and then in March, we're going to uh, have a, um, a talk from Ukraine or, and, and the uh, focus on, and be presented with a philosopher uh, from the Ukrainian heritage. So we'll be, um, very busy for many weeks to come. And of course, again, you can always keep track of things, um, present, future, or past, on our website, worldculture.org. Uh, just a reminder that the Institute is supported solely by voluntary donations. There is a donation basket in the back table, or you can mail um, any uh, a check, and I think you can still use PayPal, right? Um, so the address of the institute is on the um, it's on the uh, the uh, website, so you can see that. So um, I think we're very uh, grateful for having um, just the opportunity to be pursuing these. Um, large aims, like, and so we can now have some interesting, um, um, I don't, well, methods, we might say, of um, trying to learn about and study about the emergence of world culture, and we'll put that under <laughs> the framework of uh, Neo-Confucian methodology, I think. So uh, we're going to ask um, Jerry Lewin to come forth and to give the vote of thanks. <clears throat> there you go. Let me get my camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
We are so grateful to you for this beautiful presentation. And I think I speak for everyone sincerely saying we've all been challenged. We feel uplifted. We feel like we really want to know and contribute to the good of humanity using these ideas. And um, one of the, I'm just gonna share a couple of highlights because there's just so much and fortunately we can go back over it. Um, on the um, YouTube station that we have at any point in time. But uh, one of the things is how relevant this whole topic is to modern society and to humanity, because this is like a renewal of Confucian thought, but in a way that's adding so much, and it's delightful to, to hear about it. For example, one of the key takeaways for me was um, the oneness of the whole is really the basis of knowledge that one practices within a holistic interdependent cosmos. And I feel in studying Confucius before, that was may have been inferred a bit, but not at all as clearly as we just now heard. Um, the individual can become a crucial agent according to these teachings of change not only for oneself, but contribute to the whole of society. And this is through knowing, that the role of knowing is so important in this. It's knowing by principle, not just uh, kind of a cold intellectual knowing. And that this allows us to live ethically, and that the why of it is this motive, this motive to merge oneself with the Tao, to attain this wholeness of, of wisdom, if you will, um, and to live in harmony with all, which is such a beautiful ideal and is felt by probably every person who's, who's listening to this right now. And then also we want to just thank you personally for your courageous intellectual sharing of these ideas and for just your exceptional scholarship and the fact that you bridge so many cultures and are bringing so many people together around the world. Um, and um, I think also that um, we've heard from others uh, that you just are an ex exceptional teacher. Your ability to teach is something that's so, so needed and so valuable. And um, I think we're all hoping that we become like the sage that can pick up the banana peel without even <laughs> thinking. So thank you so much, and join me in uh, applause for this talk. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, that brought tears to my eyes. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. I write about crying, so I'm not. I'm not hiding from my tears. <laughs> well, it was remarkable and very educational because, you know, I had studied Confucianism.